So what? BOA won the hits. <laughs> Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program... You will hear stories from Dan Novak, Jill Robbins, and Gregory Stockel. John Russell presents this week's Everyday Grammar Lesson. We close the show by hearing another winning entry from our Teach Us About Ukraine writing contest. But first... European Union lawmakers gave final approval to the 27-nation group's artificial intelligence law Wednesday. The rules are expected to take effect later this year. Lawmakers in the European Parliament voted in favor of the Artificial Intelligence Act five years after regulations were first proposed. Major technology companies have generally supported the idea, but they want to make sure new AI requirements work in their favor. OpenAI chief Sam Altman suggested the maker of ChatGPT might pull out of Europe if it cannot comply with the AI Act. He later said his company had no plans to leave. Here are some details about Europe's new AI rules. Like many EU regulations, the AI Act started as consumer safety legislation. The EU took a risk-based approach to products or services that use artificial intelligence or AI. If an AI application is risky, then more rules cover it. Most AI systems are expected to be low-risk, like content recommendation systems, or filters that block spam or unwanted email. Companies can choose to follow voluntary requirements and codes of conduct. High-risk uses of AI include tools used in medical devices or important infrastructure like water or electrical networks. Those face additional requirements, like using what the legislation calls high-quality data and providing clear information to users. Some AI uses are banned because they are considered to present an unacceptable risk. Those include things like social scoring systems that are meant to govern how people behave, some sorts of predictive policing and emotion recognition systems also are reportedly banned in schools and workplaces. Other banned uses include ones that police use to scan faces in public places using AI-powered remote biometric identification systems. There is an exception for use in serious crimes like kidnapping or terrorism. The law's early versions centered on AI systems that carry out limited tasks, like reviewing employment information and job applications. But general AI models like OpenAI's ChatGPT forced EU officials to add rules for generative AI models. AI chatbot systems that can produce lifelike responses, images, and more are examples of generative AI models. Developers of general-purpose AI models will have to provide detailed descriptions of the writings, pictures, video, and other data on the Internet that was used to train the systems. They must also follow EU copyright law. AI-generated pictures, video, or audio of existing people, places, or events must be labeled as artificially produced. These sorts of media are known as deepfakes because they appear to show real people doing or saying things that are not real. 
There are reportedly extra rules for the biggest and most powerful AI models that carry systemic risks. Those include OpenAI's GPT-4 and Google's Gemini. The EU first suggested AI regulations in 2019. Europe was quick to propose rules for the new and developing industry. In the U.S., President Joe Biden signed an executive order on AI in October. The U.S. Congress is likely to propose legislation. Lawmakers in at least seven U.S. states are working on their own AI legislation. And international agreements are possible, too. Chinese President Xi Jinping has proposed his Global AI Governance Initiative for fair and safe use of AI. Other major countries, including Brazil and Japan, are developing rules, as are the United Nations and Group of Seven Industrialized Nations. The AI Act is expected to officially become law by May or June, after approval from EU member countries. Rules will start taking effect slowly. Countries will be required to ban unapproved AI systems six months after the law takes effect. Rules for general-purpose AI systems like chatbots will start going into effect in one year. By the middle of 2026, the complete set of regulations, including requirements for high-risk systems, will be in effect. Each EU country will set up their own AI enforcement agency. Citizens can make a complaint if they think they have been the victim of a violation of the rules. And the EU will create an AI office that will oversee the law for general-purpose AI systems. Violations of the AI Act could be punished with a fine of up to $38 million, or 7% of a company's worldwide revenue. I'm Dan Novak. Math lovers celebrate Pi Day on March 14th, or 314. Around the world, many people even mark the day by eating a tasty piece of pie. For those who do not know, Pi is a mathematical constant, a value that never changes. It expresses the ratio of a circle's circumference, the distance around the circle, to its diameter the distance across the circle, passing through its center. The approximate value of this mathematical constant is 3.14159265535. But those are just the first ten digits of pi. The numbers go on infinitely or forever. Pi can calculate the circumference of a circle by measuring the diameter and multiplying that by the 3.14 plus number. The formula has been used in physics, astronomy, engineering, and other fields dating back thousands of years. Long before computers, scientists such as Isaac Newton spent many hours calculating decimal places by hand. But today, researchers use computers to come up with trillions of digits for pi, but there is no end. There are many uses for pi. The number helps calculate the size of paper rolls used in printers, and it helps decide the necessary size of a container that serves heating and air conditioning systems in buildings of different sizes. 
scientists use the number to point an antenna toward a satellite and calculate the orbits and positions of planets and other space bodies. Scientists with the American Space Agency, NASA, use pi to calculate when parachutes should open as a vehicle splashes down on Earth or lands on Mars. In 1706, British mathematician William Jones began using the Greek letter pi for the number 3.14. It is the first Greek letter in the words for instance, as circumference. Pi Day itself dates back to the year 1988. That was when physicist Larry Shaw began celebrations at the Exploratorium, a science museum in San Francisco, California. The so-called holiday did not gain national recognition until more than 20 years later. In 2009, the U.S. Congress declared every March 14th to be Pi Day as a way to bring more interest in math and science. The San Francisco Museum that started the holiday organizes events, including a walk around a circular sign called the Pi Shrine, 3.14 3.14 times. Of course, there is also plenty of pie to eat. Many Pie Day events take place at colleges in the United States. For example, Nova Southeastern University, NSU, in Florida, holds the mental math bingo game with free pizza pies. Jason Gershman oversees NSU's math department. He said, Every year, Pi Day provides us with a way to celebrate math, have some fun, and recognize how important math is in all our lives. NASA has its yearly Pi Day challenge online. The space agency offers games and puzzles, such as calculating the orbit of an asteroid or the distance a moon rover would need to travel each day to study a certain lunar area. If you still wonder why Pi Day is such an important day for math lovers, here are two more reasons. Albert Einstein, possibly the world's best-known scientist, was born on March 14, 1879. And famed physicist Stephen Hawking died on March 14, 2018, at age 76. Although pi is not a perfect number, Hawking once had this to say, One of the basic rules of the universe is that nothing is perfect. Perfection simply doesn't exist. Without imperfection, neither you nor I would exist. And happy pi day. I'm Jill Robbins. In the eastern state of Virginia, employees of the Richmond Wildlife Center are doing their best to act like mother foxes. They started feeding and caring for a baby fox called a kit when the young animal became separated from its mother. The Associated Press reported that a video recently appeared on the center's page on the social media service Facebook. In the video, Executive Director Melissa Stanley is shown wearing a red fox mask and equipment like rubber gloves. She feeds the young fox in the video. The kit sits on top of a stuffed animal that looks like a fox. It is supposed to look like her mother, Stanley said. The Facebook post explained why employees were wearing the fox mask to feed the baby animal. 
It also said workers are avoiding making human sounds and are preventing the kit from seeing its human caregivers. The post said the orphan should not become too close to humans while it is being raised by them. The measures make it more likely that the kit could be returned to the wild. Stanley said a man brought the kit to the center on February 29th. She said he found the animal on the street while walking his dog in Richmond. Thinking she was a baby cat, the man turned her over to the Richmond Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, or Richmond SPCA. The Richmond SPCA is a nonprofit organization that takes in cats and dogs without owners and finds them homes. Wildlife Center employees try to find the kit's mother and their home, or den. They found the den, but they were told by officials that the foxes had been trapped and removed. Stanley said she thinks the fox kit either fell out of a trap or fell off the back of the trapper's truck. Employees at the Wildlife Center have been taking turns feeding the kit every two to four hours. They all wear the fox mask while feeding her. In addition to the large stuffed animal meant to look like the kit's mother, employees also put a smaller stuffed red fox in her space. She cuddles up to the smaller stuffed animal at the end of the video. Stanley said, The goal is to release the animals back into the wild. She added that the goal is not to just increase their chances of survival, but to raise them to recognize other animals of their kind. Another goal, she said, was that the animals should reproduce. The center looked for other red fox kits of the same age and weight at other centers. Employees found three other kits in a center in Northern Virginia. The fox kit will be sent to the Animal Education and Rescue Organization in Virginia. That group plans to release the kits back into the wild together. I'm Gregory Stockel. Consider a time when you sat down to share a dish with family or friends. What was the dish? Is the dish special in your country or area? In today's lesson, we will explore how to talk about foods. We will learn about the structures and words commonly used to talk about popular dishes. Let's start with a comparison between cooking and grammar. Just as we have common ingredients when we cook, oil, salt, vegetables, meats, and so on, we also have common ingredients for sentences about food. These language ingredients include nouns, adjectives, and special kinds of phrases. Just as cooking is about using food ingredients in special ways, Food discussions are about using language ingredients in special ways. Our first ingredient is the noun. Nouns give us the name of a dish or any food prepared in a special way. Nouns also give us names for all the spices and other materials that go into the dish. But nouns alone cannot make a rich, 
complete sentence. We need something else to add color, smells, and taste. That is how we arrive at adjectives. Adjectives are central to discussions about food. When we talk about any kind of dish, we describe it in terms of taste, color, smell, temperature, and so on. In other words, adjectives are like spices that bring flavor to plain nouns. There are many adjectives we use to describe dishes, but some common ones include rich, spicy, sweet, and fresh. So we have noun and adjectives, but we have one missing element. We need to express how ingredients go together to make up a dish. One phrasal verb is especially useful in this regard: consist of. We have the verb consist, and the short word of. Consist of means to be formed or made of exact things. So you might say that pizza consists of flour, cheese, sauce, and vegetables, or you might say that kebab consists of meat and spices. There are, of course, many other phrasal verbs you can use to describe the act of cooking. We have explored some of them in previous everyday grammar lessons. So far, we have covered a lot of territory: nouns, adjectives, and one phrasal verb. How might we use these ingredients? Here is one possible example for how to describe any national dish. Noun is the national dish of noun. It is a adjective, dish that phrasal verb, noun, noun. And noun. How might we fill in the noun, adjective, and phrasal verb spots? Let's use a traditionally popular dish in the United States as our example: apple pie. You may have heard the expression "as American as apple pie." So, what could we say about apple pie if we used our example structure? Here is one possibility. Apple pie is the national dish of the United States. It is a sweet dish that consists of apples, sugar, flour, and spices. Of course, one could go on to add more details. You could say that apple pie also often includes a small amount of lemon juice, or that apple pie is often served with ice cream on top. You have learned about one possible way to describe a popular American dish. Now we would like to hear from you. Can you write to us about a traditional dish in your country? Try to use the sentence structures that you have learned about, but feel free to include more details. Send us your piece of writing in an email to learningenglish at voanews dot com. In a future lesson. We will provide feedback on the writing that we receive. I'm John Russell. Just heard this week's everyday grammar lesson. John Russell is here now to talk a little more about it. Hi, John. Welcome. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for having me on the show. In the lesson, you give an example about apple pie. Would you like to talk more about this special dessert? Sure. The United States does not have an official national dish. Americans have different ideas about what the national dish of the U.S. should be. Some people might say it is hamburgers or hot dogs. So the claim that America's national dish is apple pie could be a little controversial. 
It's a fun debate to have. I am going to nominate chili with cornbread as a candidate for America's national dish. That's a popular regional dish, but I'm not so sure it's a national dish. Yeah, that's true. It's really popular in Texas, for example. I'm sure that the title of national dish is a controversial issue in many countries. I bet it is, and I hope to hear about it in messages from our readers and listeners around the world. I'm looking forward to that too. Well, thanks again, John, for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. See you next time. My name is Oksana Chilumbitko. I teach at Chihuahua Lyceum Number One. This is my essay. Shevchenko Garden, located in the heart of Kharkiv, is a significant public park named after the renowned Ukrainian poet Taras Shevchenko. Established in 1907, the garden has a rich history beginning as a botanical garden showcasing Ukraine's diverse flora. Over the years, it has transformed into a beloved recreational space, hosting various events, art exhibitions, and concerts, making it an integral part of Kharkiv's cultural scene. In addition to its cultural significance, Shevchenko Garden plays a crucial role in preserving biodiversity. The park is home to a wide range of plant and animal species, some of which are rare and endangered. You can freely visit the modern and renovated Kharkiv Zoo, which is located in Shevchenko Garden. Efforts are made by the park's caretakers to maintain the ecological balance, ensuring the conservation of these species for future generations. The garden's allure is not only in its natural beauty, but also in its ability to bring people together. Families gather for picnics, children enjoy outdoor activities, and artists find inspiration amidst the serene surroundings. There are small, cozy cafes and ice cream stalls, restaurants and coffee shops, a concert hall, and an opera house. Lots of people spend their time in this peaceful and tranquil place. Shevchenko Garden serves as a symbol of unity in Kharkiv, welcoming people from diverse backgrounds and fostering a sense of community. This is very important nowadays during the war. People in Kharkiv are courageous and resilient. They adore the city and make it better every single day. Today, Shevchenko Garden stands as a testament to the city's cultural richness and the harmonious existence of nature and humanity. It continues to be a peaceful oasis where visitors can experience the beauty of nature and the spirit of Kharkiv in a peaceful setting. I'm Gina Bennett. That's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.